Welcome to another episode of Myth Busting with Vince and Treverian. This week we tackle is non-metallic metal, or NMM, better than true metallic metal, or TMM. What down they vote? All right, so I think the common myth here is that, and this is especially true as you begin to learn how to paint and as you start growing and learning more about the art world and about miniature painting in general, is that non-metallic metal is a superior way, a superior technique uh, over true metallic metal. Oh, I see. We're doing the, the hard-hitting ones right in the first season. But what does it mean in the painting world if something is better than something else? Because how are we going to measure that, right? Whenever we do something creative, it's something we want to do. If we were trying to do, say, the most realistic, then we would all be doing scale modeling and not uh, miniature painting. Of course, that is an option too, but... I guess it would be half the fun if everyone just tried to recreate the same historically accurate um, or, you know, in the setting accurate uh, type of thing, if we were talking about science fiction, right? So right off the bat, I would say you should be doing whatever you find more interesting and whatever you have the most fun with. Now, that is easily said, and ultimately, there is different properties and different strengths and weaknesses to either of the techniques, so I think we can get into that also. Treverian's point is well taken here. If you look at scale models, they're absolute enthusiasts of true metallic metals. If you look at your average aircraft or something like that submitted, at a scale model event, it's going to be a shiny, true metallic metal polished bird. It's not going to be done in some kind of detailed non-metallic metal because it's meant to represent and look like that thing actually did. So in that case, the realism, whatever that means, is interpreted quite differently. So maybe that's where we start. I agree with you better is clearly a myth because that doesn't actually mean anything. But a lot of people have that in their head. So let's get down and talk about individually why you might like one over the other. And I think it's interesting because the intuitive idea would be that metallic pigments are the more realistic choice because they reflect light. And if you turn it around um, or, you know, whatever you painted, if you turn that around, then the reflection follows you and it's going to be quote-unquote correct from every angle. The strength of non-metallic metal that if you want to create something and want, you want to have a lot of control over it and you want to have control over where you place the highlights, then non-metallic metal is the way to go. Um, there's always a bit of a, a critique point that non-metallic metal only looks good from one direction or one uh, angle and that painters that use non-metallic metal are only painting for the picture. And I'm quite torn on that myself because on one hand, it is absolutely true that you can paint a perfect uh, 3D miniature for a 2D picture. And that uh, where you can control exactly where the highlights go and everything else and especially the reflections. So from that one angle, you basically create an illustration in 3D that you are going to take a picture of and then it's going to end up in 2D. And I know that there's a lot of people that paint like that. For example, uh, Michael Pisarski is very deliberate about that. If you ever did a workshop with him, he usually um, takes a figure and then decides on, on an, a viewing angle that, you know, the figure is going to end up with and then he does exactly the quote-unquote correct light for that situation 
on the other hand, I think, on the other hand, I disagree with that notion that there is only that there is only a way to to paint non-metallic metal from one angle. I feel like you can very well produce a non-metallic metal that looks good from many different angles. So once again, I think Treverian is exactly right here. You absolutely can have non-metallic that's working from multiple viewing angles. Here up on screen, I have Darren Latham's miniature painting blog. I'll put this in the show notes as well in the description. But down here, he talks about how he thinks about non-metallic metal. And to me, this is one of the all-time great articles to help you understand the concept and how it can work from multiple angles. And it gets right here how he thinks about the four light setup. And what this allows him to do is create, as you can see, multiple lights, secondary lights, and reflected lighting sources that overall produce a more realistic image, regardless of how you're viewing it. And in fact, throughout this article, and indeed throughout the all of the pictures he shares, you can look at most of these images from multiple viewing angles, and they'll continue to hold up and continue to seem to glint like metal, even though they're done in that non-metallic style. Which brings us to an easy critique. The floor of true metallic metal, when you're painting with true metal paints, is it looks like metal. It's very hard to make metal paints not look like metal. But with non-metallic metal, you have to hit a certain skill floor. You have to include the right amount of contrast or whatever. Otherwise, it just ends up looking like gray paint. Yeah, I think that's where a large portion of the critique points or of the, the people that are saying, I don't like non-metallic metal because it doesn't look re realistic come, comes from. Because often there is, you know, people that try to paint non-metallic but don't really have the grasp, as you said, because they don't put in the right amount of contrast and so on. And then it looks almost like a gray, just stone and plastic. And obviously, you know, those people are going to say, um, I painted my army in non-metallic metal. And then someone sees it and says, oh, but that non-metallic metal thing doesn't really look good. Um, <clears throat> whereas when you just put on a base color of metallics and added a wash, then that instantly looks, yeah, more credible, I guess. I think that's exactly right. What we're pointing to here is that there is a lot more bad non-metallic metal out in the world than there is bad true metallic metal, right? Almost by necessity. So you have this weird bar that occurs with it, and that's what I'm trying to put my finger on, right? Where it goes from like, so in true metallic metal, the whole bar is it looks like metal, and then if you know how to shade it properly and ink it properly and highlight it and you glaze in colors, you get up to like really good looking metal at the top, right? You can you can get a really good effect out of true metallic. We'll come back to that in a second. But the bar on non-metallic looks very different. The spectrum there at the bottom is like, doesn't look like metal at all. Up to like, then you hit some minimum threshold. Okay, looks like metal. Kind of. Right? <laughs> or maybe from limited angles or certain pieces in, or certain shapes. Up to like, looks better than, at the very tip top, you've got looks better basically than you could achieve with true metallic metal because you have a much finer control over the exact paint, the exact light. But that's like this top, very thin percentage that literally goes beyond anything you can achieve with true metals. What I'm thinking of here is the work of people like Kirill Kanaev. When you look at a work like this, what you see is that what the artist was able to achieve here is something you really couldn't replicate with true metallics because it's almost a canvas painting as the way the lights and the reflections are being captured in matte paints. Yeah, another thing that I like to say or that I like to reply when people ask uh, which of the approaches is better, is it tr true metallics or non-metallics, then I always say you have to think about what you want to do. Say you're building a diorama and um, what is your ultimate goal here? Do you want the di diorama to be uh, placed somewhere where you just can see it from one angle and so on? Which comes, which goes back to the the whole non-metallic metal is more controllable and you can uh, direct the viewer a bit better. 
But I also want to say that you should be aware what mood you want to represent. So if you wanted a bit more of a grittier version um, of your diorama, then personally, I think you're better off with true metallic metal. Because especially if you're going to put a lot of weathering on, that can be tricky to do with non-metallic metal. It's not impossible. And if you have a lot of knowledge about how paint behaves and when to ap apply which layer of paint, then it can look great. What are the situations that demand or, or would be well aligned, let me put it that way, to the use of one technique versus the other? So let's start with non-metallic metal maybe. Um, we already said controllability of your light situation. Let's drill into that one real quick. Controllability. I agree with that. Do you think that that matters a great deal? Because this is what always comes up, and if we don't address it, we'll get called out for it. Does this come up and mean that non-metallics, one of, one of non-metallic metals' better uses is something like competition or display painting, so you can have that finer level of controllability? I'm not sure. You would have to have a real good grasp about uh, non-metallic metal to really pull off something uh, that is going to elevate you over everyone else that paints non-metallic metal um, and true metallic metal. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not buying the whole, you have to paint non-metallic metal um, to win a competition. At the same time, I don't buy, you have to paint true metallic metals to win a golden demon. Both of these are not uh, correct, in my opinion. I think the other situation where non-metallic becomes really appealing where you want to capture it is when you want to have a lot of different reflected environmental hues be very strong, be, be a very strong part of the piece. Metal paint is always going to feel pretty steely or pretty goldy or whatever the underlying metal you're using is. And your ability to integrate colors into true metallic metal, it can happen, but eventually it will just look like a colored version of metal. That's a very good point. So I like to compare that with using gloss varnish over matte varnish. Um, because when you're doing competition painting, you kind of want to stay away from gloss varnish or anything that paints that become glossy because they create this artificial light, this artificial uh, reflection that you cannot control. And when you're doing OSL and uh, secondary reflections or ambient reflections, yeah, like you said, you want to show that you understand where it goes in your composition. So here is my other place that I think non-metallic uh, really sells well, okay? And that is anytime you have extremely crisp, fresh, especially steel, okay? Because the cleaner that sort of thing, the more you want to achieve. What I mean by this is the more you're trying to achieve something like a chrome look or a polished metal or something like that, the farther you're going into that full plate that's been freshly polished and shined, it's not on the battlefield or whatever. You understand what I mean? But especially steel, because steel sort of has this kind of neutral, flat, mirror-like tone that we associate, when, when highly polished, that we associate with mirrors. I think the more you're using going into that, highly polished gold would also fall into this category. When you got that crisp newness you want to capture... Non-metallic is a great way to capture that crisp newness. And it makes perfect sense. Like you said, uh, you can show exactly that you understand how m many reflections are in there and that, uh, you know, something opposite it is going to influence the color, but it's also going to be slightly reflected in and distorted. And it becomes the perfect way to show how good you are and how much control you have over the brush because what you're doing is you're basically painting an illustration on top of that armor you're not painting an armor well i guess you are but you are painting an illustration of that armor in a certain environment 
Let's talk about where true metallic metal works the best. I've got a couple right off the gate. I'm interested to get your take on them. Here's mine. One, almost any time you're doing an army painting project, like you're painting for something that's going to be a, an army you play with, I think true metallic metal is almost always the right choice. Yes, uh, be simply because it's faster. You c And that goes back to something we mentioned. If you try to take shortcuts with non-metallic metal, it's not going to work and it's going to the weird and plasticky and stone-like. So you cannot take any shortcuts with non-metallic metal. You can take certain shortcuts with metallics and they're still going to look good. Um, like the Necrons that I painted a while ago, I actually thought about that I could do a kill team at least with that approach in a reasonable amount of time, which usually I can't because everything takes too long. Um, so that is a good way to use true metallics. However, that said, you can still take an army that you just apply the basic true metallic to and take it to the next level in another step. Like you can paint these lights that are still reflecting or the, those shinier areas that you want to reflect on them. So you can, you know, get them bell ready and then invest a lot more time if you want to say um, pimp your general or whatever. I'll give you another one. And you kind of mentioned it earlier where I think it just works better. And that is extremely weathered metals. Anytime you have extremely weathered, rust and rusty, rotten, twisted, old junkyard metals, I think just starting from a base of regular metal paint works better. You often don't have much in the way of reflections. It's usually more like some dull gray that just has a very slight shine to it, maybe one or two very small scratches and reflection points where the, the sort of rust got cleared away because one piece hit another in the junkyard. But for the most part, it's more of an experiment in deep grays, blacks, browns, oranges, maroons, the occasional yellow. You know, that kind of stuff ends up being, I think, better when the little bit of metal you can see still feels like dull, real metal. I agree. And when you said uh, that you can play around with scratches, I think that's especially potent because when you look at uh, that whole mess from one angle, it's, it can be a dull surface because the light is not directly going to be reflected in your eyes. And then as you turn it around, it adds another level of, of interest, of information, because when you turn it around, suddenly that very small line that you painted is going to reflect light directly into your eyes. And then you're going to see, whoa, okay, there's, there's additional scratches here where, you know, all that weathering got scraped away. That's just an example for, you can, for something that you cannot properly do with non-metallic metal, because that white line, your total ref reflection is always going to be there. So I wanted to pop in here and talk about another place where I feel true metallic really sells. And that's on things like the skeleton of an Imperial Knight, but really any big machine or engine part or something like this. This is an Imperial Knight that I painted some time back. And obviously you can tell this was done with true metallic metals. And I feel on surfaces like this, you know, the interior skeleton of the Knight or the patterning around the edge uh, of the armor plates or the engine of a scale model car or something like that, true metallic metals just work better. And the reason I believe that is because of the sheer number of surfaces and reflections that are caught here. So all of this is reinforced with inks and shading and highlights that I did try to place, but the metal paint does a lot of work for me. As you can see here in the places where it's catching the individual reflections and the lights. And as this thing moves around and changes and you look at it at different angles, each part is still going to feel metal. The idea that you would have to manually highlight the literal thousands of facets and surfaces and angle changes that this big machine has or that an engine has is crazy. You're, if one little piece is out of place, if one little highlight is wrong on an angle change, your brain is going to subconsciously pick up on it. 
Whereas when you're working on something like this and you paint it in true metallic metal, it's just going to feel a lot more realistic naturally because all of the facets, the surfaces, and the changes will naturally reflect the light. So this is one of those situations where when you get to something this complex, where there's that large number of surfaces, the right answer is almost certainly true metallic metal. So to sum it up, I want to say that there is applications for both. You should deliberately decide which fits the application that you have in mind the most. Like you said, terrain obviously is going to always look better with metallics. High-end competition painting where you want to show that you can paint these uh, reflections from the surroundings and so on. Fine, you should do that. And then there's multiple in-between steps and applications where one might be better fit, might be a better fit than the other. That said, you could still say, I don't want to do that. I prefer something else over, you know, I prefer non-metallic metal in that situation over true metallic metal. And that's fine. It's your choice. It's your world. You should decide what you want to do. Do what is fun for you. I think Trevarian ended on the perfect note there. What we know is there is no better. No, non-metallic metal is not innately better in any way than true metallic metal. It's, of course, an absolute myth. Whether we're talking for competition or for your personal use. The reality is these techniques might be aligned better to certain projects you're working on. It's good to be intentional. And it's good to think about the effect that you want and you want to capture. How much time you want to spend and what you want it to ultimately look like. But in the end, just as Trevarian said... The important part is to paint in a way that you're going to have fun with. And if that means using some bright, shiny chrome, then get out that chrome paint. And if that means putting on lots of layers and a hundred glazes to get the perfect non-metallic metal spread, then that's the right choice too. But there you go. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Myth Busting. As always, look for the next episode, which will be on Trevarian's channel. Remember, these do go back and forth. But you can always hit the playlist, which has all of the episodes, regardless of the channel, right down below. So, as always, thank you very much for watching. I very much appreciate it. And we'll see you next time.